All right, are we live now? Oh, let me check, I guess so. Yes, it's on Facebook. Yes, I can see it. It's on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, okay so uh, ladies and gentlemen, filmmakers and cinephiles, uh, good evening, salam alaikum. And here we are with our awaited discussion with Mr. David Mullen uh, about the history of cinematography and uh, I have here with me Mohammed, my friend, who is costing, who costing this, uh, costing this uh, discussion. So, hello, David. How hello. are you? I'm fine. So, how uh, how's life with with the with these all things of COVID nineteen of the of the lockdowns, so, the riots? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's surreal. Um, you know, had to. Go to a medical appointment yesterday but before i could go to the doctor i had to go get a COVID test so i had to oh. like arrange a test and then get the results back and then there's just a lot of running around oddly enough uh, yeah so well, please so, stay safe good good to have you here with we here with us so um before we dive in the history on the whole discussion i'm gonna introduce you first so david m mullen ASE, AC, which means that you are a member of the American Society of Cinematographers. And uh, you started in independent films. And I guess you shot probably something like 40 feature fil films, which I can mention uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, Norfolk, The Astronaut Farmer, and The Love, the Love Witch. And members of television series, for instance, Smash, United States of Tara, Westworld, and M the Marvelous Mrs. Basil, for which you won the Emmy Award for the Outstanding Cinematography for one category, one uh, camera of one hour. And you collaborated a lot with uh, the so-called the Polish Brothers. So Mr. Mellon studied cinematography at the California Institute of Arts and where he started his long journey of uh, cinematography. He, uh, he later collaborated with uh, his professor, I guess, Chris Malkiewicz or something like that. I, I don't think I'm uh, comfortable saying all that name. Malkiewicz, something like that? Yeah, on the, Oh, okay, that's so good. So on the, right. on the book, the cinematography on the third edition. So I, can, I have to mention something. So what's so special about Mr. Mellon, beside his artistic view of the cinematography, is the technical side of the art and the craft of cinematography. He is, uh, let me say, a nerd. He studied maybe all the, of all the books in Cal Art lib Library. And uh, what is also special about him is he shares a lot of his knowledge actively on, with the community, with the cinematographers, with all filmmakers, whether in forums especially, where I knew him uh, before in forums and you know, such as like uh, cinematography.com, rogerdeacons.com and red users. I guess at red users, he, he, have, he has a, a whole page dedicated to, to, to him, to David Mellon, ask David Mellon anything where you can find literally like thousands of entries there. And now he, he is now with us. So thank you, David. And let's start maybe with the, uh, with the first question, maybe. The first question is, we are talking about cinematography. So what is cinematography and what does a cinematographer do in pre-production, production and post-production? A well, cinematographer is essentially in charge of all the photography of uh, movies or a TV shows. So it's all the visual imagery. And uh, they have at their disposal three departments uh, during production, which is the camera department, the electric department, and the grip department. And uh, the grip and electric have their own head of the department, the gaffer and the key grip. Um, but I pretty much uh, use those three departments to get all of the setups done for a movie or a TV show. Um, Pre-production usually starts, uh, you know, right after the art director is hired, um, then the cinematographer is hired. And uh, I go through the script with the director, break it down visually, 
and then start to work out the equipment package uh, that we're going to need, lighting package. And I, you know, do that, spend that time scouting locations and also hiring the crew. And then by the end of pre-production is all the camera tests, equipment pickups, you know, finalization of, of everything. Uh, usually the director by then is busy casting and rehearsing. Um, so my time with the director kind of starts is the week before the last week of prep on a feature uh, when the director has more time for me. But uh, then on the set, um, besides the director, my key collaborator is the assistant director because, you know, we have to work on the schedule. Um, uh, you know, the time it takes to set up things is really falls under my department. So, so uh, the AD and I work closely together. And then in post-production, it's some um, color correction mainly is the is what the cinematographer is involved in. Okay, okay. So thank you. And here uh, we have uh, Mohammed, my uh, co-host. Okay, and sure. um, uh, so y you better uh, like start with the with the first question in yes. the history of his cinematography. Yeah. Go before ahead. we uh, before we start, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. David again. Thank you so much for being with us. It is such an honor. Uh, I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, my first question is uh, about the, the beginning of uh, cinematography. So after the invention of photography, uh, you know, uh, the notion of moving pictures emerged to depict the movement of uh, people and animals and everything. Mm -hmm. So, and then later on other devices were invented such as the the, the, stereo, the, the stereoscope, the kinetoscope, and everything. So, when was the, the cinema, uh, how was the cinematography born? And uh, how did it evolve? And what is the, the, the role of cinematography uh, in uh, visual storytelling? Well, I don't have the exact dates memorized, somewhere around the 1890s, I think. Um, there's some controversy, you know, the cinematography or movie photography sort of grew out of like the experiments of Moybridge which involved multiple cameras, you know, firing to photograph motion. Um, but uh, some people would say uh, in France, it was invented by uh, Le Prince, I think his name was, or, or Lumiere's, uh, or Lumiere Brothers, yeah. say uh, Edison and Dixon, WKL Dixon. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty much, um, yeah, Eastman Kodak and, uh, and Edison, and Dixon that worked out the standard, you know, film format, which was the 35 millimeter frame. I think supposedly uh, Edison said, make it this big or something. So that's that's how we ended up with more or less an inch wide piece of film on a flexible base that could run through a camera. In fact, movie film predates still photography film. It was the invention of movie film that allowed it to be loaded into still cameras and used uh, in the early uh, still cameras like the contacts and stuff. So. So the development of a flexible base that could run through a camera was, was invented specifically for movies. And uh, this is all, like I said, uh, late 1880s or early 1890s. Um, it quickly evolved into a storytelling meeting by, by 1900, 1903, you know, you start to see story films um, and editing. And even if you look at the great train robbery, which is like 1900, yeah. three or six or something it actually has special effects in it like the whole robbery of the moving train is is a uh, is a mat you know they they matted out the the view out the the doors and replaced it with a moving background so you already got pretty sophisticated filming techniques happening at that early stage and then um you know start to see lighting and things by the end of the 19 aughts and and the or the you know it's mostly early film was shot under, you know, sunlight or, or diffused sunlight, but then they started to see carbon arc lights and other things being used. Uh, and then uh, you start seeing mood effects and things in, in cinematography. So it developed into a story form pretty quickly, I think. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. Very good. So yeah, my question is what, if we, if you see cinematography, so what are the major advancement in technology or in techniques in history that helped like filmmaker tell stories? I mean, that helped the, the narrative or helped how to visually store telling the, uh, the, the, the stories. Tell about, about the major leaps, please. 
Well, I recommend it. Anyone interested in that, read this book I have here. It's called. Uh, Can you capture um, that, Eunice? Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. It's Thank called you. Film Style and His uh, Film Style and Technology by Barry Salt. It's a British book. Okay. Um, he sort of goes through decade by decade what um, technology came out and how it affected uh, storytelling. It's sort of his basic thesis is that style and technology are connected so that either style emerges from what technology is available at the time or technology comes out to, to help a style at the time, but it, they kind of, you know, interconnected in a way. Uh, so, you know, every decade he, he sort of lists the advancements in cameras, stocks, lights, uh, equipment. Um, you know, the, the development over time technically is, is Sometimes it comes in leaps and bounds, and, and then there's a period of stability. Uh, you know, I, after the early days, uh, I think um, the early 1920s, besides the, the advent of lighting, which was a big part of cinematography and still is, mm -hmm. uh, you started to see a panchromatic film came out um, and started being used instead of orthochromatic black and white film. And you started you know, having early Technicolor, uh, two strip Technicolor in the, in the uh, mid 20s, uh, Toll of the Sea, I think is 1926. Um, so early color, and there's also hand tinting and, and things like that. And then uh, obviously the next big change was sound. And the early days of sound, they had to get rid of the carbon arc lights for a while because they're too noisy and also the other, common light was this big soft light called the Cooper Hewitt. So it looks like if you look at a photo of it, it looks like a giant Kino flow. It's basically a mercury vapor tube system, almost like a giant neon sign um, that could provide a big blast of soft light, uh, which actually a lot of silent films by the late 20s were lit with soft lighting because of the Cooper Hewitt lamps, but they were noisy and uh, they put out this blue green color, which was useless for color photography. And uh, so they disappeared when sound came along. And then you had incandescent tungsten being taking over all the sets until uh, they figured out a way to make carbon arcs quiet again. Um, so, you know, the early sound, uh, the other problem was, of course, the, uh, the cameras had to be silenced for recording sound. And it took a few years before you started to see a lot of camera movement again. And, they figured out a way to blimp cameras and make them mobile again and shoot sound and, and also learn to shoot silent and add sound later and, and other things like that. So, um, but stylistically, I mean, these, the film stocks of the thirties were pretty slow still, you know, they, I guess, uh, Pan X, which was. Less um, than hundred. It was, Pan X was the most common, I think, movie stock in the early thirties. And it must've been, around 30 ASA, you know, 32 oh. ASA, because um, it's low. Uh, it was basically when plus X came along in 1938, that uh, doubled the speed to 64 ASA or 80. Um, so uh, that was a big leap in 38 when stocks started getting faster. Um, but the, it's always hard to figure out what speed or ASA these stocks of back then were because the ASA system didn't come about until the late 30s. So. Before that, you started to hear stocks being referred to by their Weston ratings, or there were just just general recommended exposure, you know, number of foot candles needed, sort of uh, recommendations. So, it's uh, it gets a bit hard to figure out what the ASA rating was. The same thing with Technicolor when it came along. Three strip Technicolor came along in the uh, mid '30s, and uh, it was black and white film, but it was three different black and white film stocks inside the camera. And so, and the light through the lens was being split by a prism in half, and then it had to pass through filters to these black and white films to record the red, green, and blue information. So you could find out the ASA of the film stocks, but to really know what practical ASA you're working at, you had to know the density of the filters, the light loss of the prism, all these things. You know, basically, I, some people guess that Three strip Technicolor when it came out was roughly five ASA, you know, which gives you an idea of how much light was needed. And then when the faster black and white films came along in 1938, Technicolor announced that they had doubled the speed 
of Technicolor because the black and white stocks were doubled. So, so Technicolor became about 10 ASA by the time they did Gone with the Wind, for example. And that was considered fast, you know, for Technicolor. Um, by the end, by 1952, when Technicolor switched to a tungsten balance system, they had gotten themselves up to above 16 ASA, maybe they were close to 20, 25 ASA. They call it their fast, you know, again, wow. fast Technicolor. Um, oh. well, and, we're talking uh, maybe in 3200 now. Huh? We are talking about 3200 now. That's a huge evolution. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you know, these stocks, and, and when you know the speed of the stocks, you can get an idea of what the light levels were like back then and what the average f stop was. I mean, for color films, it was generally quite low. They had to shoot more or less near wide open, like 284. Yeah. Eight, um, but uh, black and white film kept getting faster, and, and then it became popular to go for deep focus photography. So, it took a tremendous amount of light, even with black and white film. But, um, you start to see deeper and deeper f-stops being used and deeper focus by the 40s and 50s for black and white movies. And so right. it's just that's a hey, one really answer to that. Uh, you know, uh, they, okay. they've been the, by the 50, 50s, besides uh, color negative film, you had the, the widescreen explosion. That was the next big change in Hollywood. After sound, sound came out in 27, um, and there was talk about changing the film format to match the sound. You know, they basically everyone said, well, if we're going to stick a soundtrack on the print, maybe we should come up with a better print format and a better camera format. But the depression pretty much killed a lot of that, oh. in, you know, mm -hmm. drive. They just, there wasn't money after the change yeah, over the sound depression. to change over cameras. So there was a lot of experimental widescreen cameras that were built in the 30s that just never got used. They got used for one movie. Mm -hmm. Um, like Fox Grandeur was used, to, uh, that was a 70 millimeter process. Wow. Um, it got used on one movie or so. So by the 50s, uh, you had in 52, um, this is Cinerama, which was a huge that's success. And, and it was more or less an independent movie. So it really caused Hollywood to take notice because a bunch of independent producers <laughs> created uh, this format and then would basically set up theaters around the country and show uh, the Cinerama films, which were mostly travelogues back then. But uh, there were line, uh, lines uh, around the block for that. Just, just a second to interrupt you, sorry. Yeah. But uh, uh, a lot of our audiences, I uh, don't think they don't know those series Cinerama, which is like uh, the, the, the curved, extremely curved format that we use maybe three cameras to shoot, three synchronized camera we shoot and with three synchronized projectors, which, which is like, which was like very expensive to shoot. And then maybe it didn't like really uh, succeed that time. Did the... well, it was it was limited, you know. Like you say, it was three a uh, three camera, three film stock, and three projector prints running on a curved screen. I think total negative. It was uh, each frame was six per thirty five. So the total amount of negative area being used for the image was bigger than seventy millimeter. It was somewhere closer to IMAX. So you can imagine how. Well how sharp and big the image was on the screen, mm -hmm. especially when you only, a projector only had to fill one third of the screen. So each projector could be very sharp, sharply focused. Mm -hmm. um, you did have problems with that process because every camera had its own vanishing point. So you had, you had an image with three vanishing points and mm -hmm. you had to watch when an object moved between the splits between the, the three images. Um, it's a very wide angle image on top of that. So. 146, um, 146 degree, I guess, something like yeah. that. Mm. It'd be the equivalent of like shooting, if you're shooting 35 millimeter film, it'd be like shooting everything on a 10 millimeter lens or a 9.8, you know, canoptic or something. Wow. It's very, very wow. wide angle, almost close to fisheye. Um, but uh, that was 52 and it, it stayed around until around 62. So it was about 10 years it lasted. Um, and it, you know, it was so, such a success that Hollywood tried to copy it. And, and so in 53, uh, CinemaScope came out, which was regular 35 millimeter with an anamorphic lens to squeeze a wide image onto the squarish negative and then squeeze it in the projector. And then uh, soon after that, you had uh, VistaVision, which was the first larger format, you know, eight per horizontal 35. And then someone put an anamorphic lens on VistaVision and created Technorama. 
And then you had the even larger film format, 65 millimeter, 70 millimeter uh, print stock um, for uh, Oklahoma. And this is like 55, 56. So, is you know, the that's ultra, just an explosion uh, of formats, basically. Uh, is that the Ultra Panavision and the MGM 65, Ultra Panavision 70 millimeter? Yeah, then once 70 millimeter came along, someone had the idea to put an anamorphic lens on 70 millimeter. Um, it was mainly because uh, Cinerama had a very wide aspect ratio. It was around 266 to 1. And Cinemascope was, you know, 235 to 1 back then. So they, to get even wider, uh, they, they put a slight anamorphic lens on a 70 millimeter print uh, projector and stretched the 70 millimeter image out to Cinemascope proportions, uh, Cinerama proportions. That was the original idea of, of, of Ultra Panavision MGM Camera 65 was to, to shoot in a format that you could create a Cinerama print or, or show it in 70 millimeter or show it in 35 Cinemascope. Um, but what happened was the uh, <clears throat> Cinerama Corporation, which was a privately owned corporation, was bought out by uh, the Pacific Theater Group in 1962, 63. And at that time, they decided to just drop the whole three projector, three camera format and go with 70 millimeter, single camera uh, format and single projector projection. So that's, they kind of bought the format and then killed it basically. Mm -hmm. uh, they were building the Cinerama Dome at that time and, and they never showed Cinerama in the Cinerama Dome until recently, um, about 10 years ago. So oh. because they, they set up the three projector booths in that theater but in 63, when the theater finally opened, they converted to 70 millimeter and they showed um, It's a Mad Mad World there, which was, uh, you know, Ultra Panavision. So it wasn't until someone restored How the West Was Won, which was shot in three panel Cinerama, um, they made a restored three print uh, version and they basically went into the Cinerama Dome and cleaned out the other two projection booths, which had never been used. They were just storage rooms. and and bought, brought in some period Cinerama projectors and, and showed the movie in Cinerama there, um, so. Wow. Okay, so Mohammed, I guess he's, he has a question about uh, colors. Oh yes, yeah, going back to colors, uh, so David, uh, I'd like you to talk uh, about the, the example of uh, Akira Kurosawa. Uh, he has only few uh, colored movies, but he was able to portray so much uh, emotions and 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 uh you know now now we're going back to uh we're moving from technicalities now <laughs> we're talking yeah. about colors and uh, so kira kurosawa was able to to use colors lavishly in only like five movies maybe uh, so can you talk 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 to us more about his use of color well, um, you know, he, he dabbled a little in co the color effect in uh, High and Low. I don't know if you've ever seen that black and white movie about the uh, kidnapping, but in the story, uh, the, the police put the uh, ransom money into a bag that they say, if the kidnappers try to burn the bag, it will emit a cloud of pink smoke. And so and then they're standing on the balcony of the apartment and in the distance, you see a cloud of pink smoke, which required hand tinting every tinting, print yeah. of the movie. Yes, uh, to get that that pink yeah. cloud, and actually, I saw it in a sixteen millimeter reduction print where wow. they got they stopped doing the hand tinting and they just made that one shot on the color print stock, and they would hand animate the pink <laughs> around the cloud and then put it on the wow. on a black and white image. But because it had to be on a color print, what happened was that one shot would fade to pink, so because the color print isn't stable. And so now when you see that shot, the whole shot is pink rather than the cloud of smoke being pink, it way cut to a pink shot essentially uh, in some prints oh, of that movie. Amazing. But, um, uh, but he didn't make a color film until The Desk of Den, which was yeah. I think like 1970 or 69 or yeah. 71. It was in the 70s, late. yeah. Um, and then he did Dirzu Azala after that. Uh, so it was very late to the game for color, but he had been a, painter and illustrator as well as you know writer and director mm -hmm. and so I think um, his years of experience in terms of painting is what informed his color work they're very the colors are very painterly they're very you know he's, he's stylized everything you sometimes see that with directors who primarily work in black and white and then finally do a color movie when they finally do a color movie they be they have a hard time yeah. 
they dealing with color. They, they start <laughs> trying to control everything in yeah. the frame because they're just not used to color. It happened with Fellini. I think his first color film was Juliet of the Spirits. And apparently he had a, a green lawn spray painted different shades of green until he got the shade of green he liked, you know, because it just looked wrong wow. to his eyes. So, <clears throat> and even with David Lynch, you look at yeah. um, Dune, for example, you know, it's very stylized in the use of color yeah. because yeah. he'd been only doing black and white up until that point. Uh, but I think it's the same thing with Kurosawa, you know, he, after doing black and white for so many years when he finally did color, it became very stylized because he, he felt the need to control it. And it was a film about, you know, people, homeless people living in a junkyard, but he's yeah. spray painted every piece of junk, you know, uh, everything is, is very like, carefully color controlled. Um, but it also matched his kind of pre-production paintings. And you see that even more than with, yeah. with Kagamusha and Ron. Yume also, the, his movie Yume was, uh, was inspired by his dreams as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, all those color films, of course, were regular Kodak color film stock by then. The Technicolor didn't exist anymore. Uh -huh. but so he's working with regular Kodak film. Um, a lot of his later films were all shot on zoom lenses and, and it wasn't because he necessarily wanted to use a zoom, it's because he didn't like the mismatch in color between the lenses, the prime oh, lenses. Yeah. So he yeah. felt he, he could control the color better if, the, if it's just one lens on the okay. camera as much as possible, so. That's oh, the amazing. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I guess let's back to uh, a bit to some technicalities and uh, <laughs> how we, we're talking about cinematography. Of course, so, of course. Let's not talk a lot about film now. Now, so let's move a bit to digital. We are, all our audiences are uh, digital generation and all it's like it's, let's, uh, let's say that it's a di digital revolution. So the digital revolution opened a field of possibilities and uh, maybe impossible to do with film before, whether for big scale production, studio levels, or even with young filmmakers who has like low, very low budget films. You know, practically you know, everybody can use even a phone to shoot, uh, to shoot a film, maybe with a DSLR or mirrorless cameras. So, and I guess a lot of people had the uh, had the opportunity to be a cinematographer now. So the cameras were are now more accessible. And how, in your opinion, this is this all revolution of the digital is affecting art and the craft of the cinematography side? Well, I, I was there at the beginning of the, uh, you know, switch to 24 frame digital is, uh, when the Sony F900 came out and the DFX, DVX 100 came out. That was all 1999, 2000, 2001 era time. Um, so I did a lot of my independent films on, on digital in the early days uh, of 24 PhD. Um, and then I went back to film for a while until pretty much digital took over again, basically. It, you know, it sort of introduced big in 2000, 2001, but then it sort of had a, a second sort of a rebirth with um, in the 2007, eight, you know, when the Genesis and the red cameras and then the Larry Alexa came out in 2010. So uh, that's when uh, Hollywood films really started switching over. Um, but, uh, you know, be before even 24P came along, you had the whole Dogma 95 movement in the 90s, which was using it's uh, a Dutch, how, it's a, how it's video. A Dutch movie. What? It's a, Dutch, it's a Dutch movie, Dogma 95. It's a movement, yeah, not a movie. It's a, it's a whole movement of filmmakers, um, you know, Lars Ventures and oh. Thomas Vintenberg and a bunch of people. They had mm. a whole series of rules they had to follow, but... But a lot of them were shot on handheld little um, consumer DV cameras. Oh. Uh, it, the funny thing is Dogma 95 had no rule about shooting film or digital. It just, they just sort of embraced shooting digital as a way of, because their rules were not lighting, not, you know, oh. pretty much oh. they were shooting handheld. And, uh, Todd Mental got an Oscar right uh, after like in 2006, and he was from the movement, right? Who? Todd Mental. And Todd Tony. Mental, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. He shot. I wouldn't say he shot the celebration. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he uh, he did um, Some Dog Millionaire, you know, which has some yeah. elements yeah. of that that style in it with with the use of digital for the for the the uh, SI two K camera for some of the the, the scenes in the uh. in India there where they're running through the streets yeah. and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean it's. Uh, you know, before uh, digital, you had independent filmmakers shooting 16 millimeter as a low cost alternative to 35. And sort of DV was considered a lower cost version of even 16. You know, it was back in the 90s when you didn't have money for 35. It was like, yeah, you shoot 16, but then DV started to be seen and, and it didn't look very good on the big screen, but it was yeah. sort of embraced as a, as a sort of almost like punk rock, you know, just kind of a, a rough uh, style. But uh, everyone was waiting for when digital would actually technically match the look of, of 35 millimeter film. And that's when you had um, the Sony F900 HD camera came along in 2000, which did 24 frames per second. And a lot of people had been pushing for years for a 24 frame camera. But um, it was, I think a lot of people were surprised at how much that made a difference. Like when it finally came out, it was surprising how much that did contribute to the film look of a digital camera. And that's when you started to really see debate about now whether digital should replace film, even though it was a bit early. I remember one director had a website called filmisdead.com. And this was 2000. And he said, film is gonna be dead in five years. <laughs> and uh, I was said, well, you know, if you think it's five years, then it's probably gonna be more like 15 years, you know? <laughs> and uh, I was, more accurate than he was probably because um, by 2015 yes. it really had declined quite a bit. But um, but it you know it it takes a lot longer than people think to make. Was, some it, of was that Soderbergh? I, I know Soderbergh hates a lot of film. <laughs> no, it wasn't Soderbergh, and uh, I don't. And it was a, a director named Bernard Rose. Uh, um, okay, he had this website, um, but uh, you know the. But eventually, you know, everyone said, well, digital is going to get better. It's going to get better. And uh, eventually it did get better, you know. It, it didn't, it wasn't, it was gradual, you know, after the Sony F900, the F950, the Viper camera, everyone said the next step has got to be a 35 millimeter size sensor. So we can use our regular 35 millimeter lenses on them. And that's when the uh, wow. Genesis camera came out in 2006, 2005. Genesis is that the Panavision? Panavision Genesis. Panavision, but it's basically the same camera as the Sony F35. It's a Sony camera with Panavision lenses. Um, and then after they had a deal with Panavision, with Sony, I want to say it's like a two year moratorium where Sony couldn't put out a camera for two years until the Genesis had been out for two years. And then the Sony uh, F35 came out, which is more or less the same technology. Um, but in super so, you know, then the, then that was 35 millimeter HD uh, resolution. Uh, and everyone said, well, the next step has got to be uh, data recording. You know, we got to get out of videotape. And but videotape was so convenient to shoot. You know, you could you shoot a movie on tape. You put the tape in a vault and you don't pull it out till you need it later for color correction. With, with digital with data, you had to store that data somewhere all through post-production. Uh, you know, how do you store terabytes of data? Basically, it was a big deal back then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. People were trying to, you know, with the Viper movies, they were trying to deal with that. They were sticking them on the LTO tapes and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, then the tsunami hit in Japan and, and just, you know, temporarily shut down the only manufacturer of HD cam SR tape. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the studios and everyone were scrambling to make data recording work for these cameras. And by the time the, the uh, tape factory was up and running again, it was too late. The studios and everyone had switched over to data, you know, as the primary way of, st of storing information off these cameras. Um, but, uh, you know, the, once the quality improved, um, the, uh, and then the cost started going down and down and down. So uh, it certainly freed a lot of filmmakers up to get both a high quality looking image, what you might call professional looking, I guess, and do it at a low cost. Uh, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a big change. In some ways, I almost want to say that um, 
a disadvantage and disadvantage. You see the same thing in still photography because with everyone's got cameras that can shoot beautiful images, it starts to be less about the technical quality anymore. When everyone's technical quality is at a pretty high level, then what you judge a, an image on has got to be more artistic, you know, the lighting, yeah. the actual yeah. image, you know. So which is good in some ways. And I think the technology starts to be less important as it becomes better in quality and more available to everyone. So, mm -hmm. so uh, before going to Mohammed with his uh, question, and uh, speaking of uh, the F900, so before, like, I guess you used in 1999 or 2000 in your film Jackpot. Yeah. And that was even maybe before George Lucas released his Star Wars Episode Two, The Attack of the Clones. Yeah. The Sony F900 came out in 2000, and it uh, George Lucas was the first to get it for Star Wars II, Attack of the Clones. Um, but he had a very long production and long post-production. So, yeah. so the camera had been out for a few months. I think it. I think it came out around, you know, for Lucas, it came out around April or May of 2000. Um, and then uh, Sim Video in Canada had bought a bunch of them was, and was trying to get TV shows to switch over from shooting film to, to 24 PhD. And they came, they had gotten uh, a TV show called Earth Final Conflict to switch over in Canada, but they brought the cameras down to Hollywood and were talking to, uh, to TV shows like Roswell, which was shooting 16 millimeter um, to see if they'd be interested in switching. And because of that, I went to a demonstration of, of the camera that Rodney Charters had done as a test for Roswell. And a lot of the actors in, Ro in, in those shows are act for the Polish brothers. And so they knew Rodney and Rodney showed us his tests and Sim Video showed us the camera. And I asked, we were about to shoot Jackpot and we were looking into shooting DV or, or some sort of maybe even early HD. Uh, and I asked Sim Video, what are you gonna do with this camera? And he goes, well, it's, it's three weeks, it's gotta go back to Canada. And I said, well, we're about to do a 12-day independent film next week. Just loan <laughs> us the camera and we'll shoot a whole movie on it in 12 days. And then you can take it back and it'll be an experiment, right? And so yeah. they said, okay, so they gave us the camera. I had like one day to learn how to use it. Um, wow. We got a, made a deal with Post Group to do the post because they wanted to learn how to do a 24P post. Um, and it was a big learning curve. But... It wasn't that hard to learn to use the camera itself because essentially it was a Sony Betacam. You know, mm. they'd taken their Betacam body, all the buttons, the menu system was from a Betacam. And I'd been shooting Betacam for industrials and EPKs for a couple of years at that point too. And so okay. I, I didn't have any trouble learning to use the camera actually. It was, it was familiar. So we shot the movie in August of 2000 and it got released in August of 2001 in movie theaters. Um, after going to Sundance in, in the January of 2001. And then finally, uh, Attack of the Clones didn't even come out until May of 2002. So, you know, we beat them by nine months to the movie theaters. <laughs> um, there was another independent film called Session Nine that Uta Briskowitz shot that came out two weeks after Jackpot. So our two films are the first 24 PhD films to come out in movie theaters. Wow. That was nice. Amazing. So, uh, Mohammed, it's your turn now to ask. Yeah, maybe you have a, another question. Yes, I do have another question. It's uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, Mr. David, in your opinion, what is the the golden age of cinematography? Do you think that uh, are we living are we living the, the 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 golden age of cinematography, or is the te is technology the the judge in in that, or what do you think? I, I don't really believe in a golden age. I think there are periods when that are interesting photographically, um, but for me, every decade has something interesting about them. Uh, you know, if you're a fan of the '70s cinematography, I mean, I'm a big fan of Gordon Willis, and and I think that's the sort of dawn of what you could call the modern yeah. look of movies. Prince of Darkness. Yeah, you know, Conrad Hall, Gordon Willis, uh, yeah. Haskell Wexler, Victoria Storaro, they all made their important films uh, in the early 70s. Um, the ones that, that, that changed the look of movies or late 60s, you know. Uh, it was not a hard line 
switch over, but yeah. it was a little, it was a little more dramatic than other transitions because Hollywood had been, you know, is sort of run by the unions. And uh, basically a lot of the cinematographers were the, started out in the, in the silent era, you know, in the classic yeah. cinematographers of the forties and fifties all started out in the tens and twenties as camera assistants. And there's some of their earliest credits as cinematographer in the mid twenties. And they worked until they retired in the seventies. So, so they, you know, you look at someone like William Daniels who, who has credits going back to greed, you know, 1920 yeah. and his last credit is like 1972 or something like that. So, so that's, you see that a lot in the ASC, there's a big age jump because a lot of cinematographers kept working till the seventies. Um, there was not a, Come up with that. you know, there's a, there's like a 20 year age gap between them and the next generation of cinematographers. Wow. There's a few transitional people like Conrad yes. Hall and Haskell Wex who, who started in the late fifties and sixties. Uh, Richard Klein, these sort of people, but but there was a otherwise there was a fairly large age jump that happened, and so so a lot of people came along in the seventies were were you know twenty years younger than than a lot of the people working in the sixties, and that caused I think a fairly strong stylistic jump in the seventies, uh, but so that, I think the seventies is a sort of golden age, um, but I also love the forties, both black and white. Um, Film yeah. noir uh, and uh, and Technicolor, three strip Technicolor musicals. Um, I think the '40s, early '50s was a, was another golden age for lighting. Um, I think the late '20s, early '30s was you know the end of the silent era was quite uh, a golden age for for cinematography too. With sunrise and um, just that films had reached a kind of height of complexity and sophistication at the very end of the silent era before sound came along. So wow. there's always these sort of periods of, of transition. And, I, and I, I like the transitional times too, when it's it's not necessarily a golden age, but where it's where it's more of a chaotic age where you have a lot of different styles clashing. I find that interesting, yes. like in the 60s, when you have the old style leaving and the new style coming in. Yes, coming um, yeah. A lot of those films and the filmmakers, like cinematographers like Jeffrey Unsworth, I, I find fascinating because they started out in the 30s, 40s, and they, they, they learned studio style photography, but then they had to work, they were working in the 70s when everything was changing and their style changed. And I think their, the way they shot movies was, a, was an interesting hybrid of old school and new school. Uh, some of the changes they were copying what were other people were doing, others they were innovating. Um, but those sort of people I find interesting, the, the people who are, who are transitioning into a new new style. Um, right. So, I mean, I think in television now, we've got a golden age for television cinematography. Exactly, yeah, I was going to ask yeah, about where that. It's really, I think in the 70s television, 60s and 70s television budgets were just very low a lot yeah. of the people who were retiring out of Hollywood ended up in television. So you had a quite old, older cinematographer shooting TV shows in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, like Rick Dalton. Uh, but, but not necessarily, um, <laughs> a lot of them were great cinematographers, but they were working on ridiculously tight schedules. You know, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on shows back then. Uh -huh. uh, but by the 80s, you saw a kind of new birth in cinematography with like what Michael Mann was doing on uh, Miami Vice. Uh, oh, shows like uh, 30 something that uh, Robert Primes was doing on that. Um, and so, and that was also the technically the age of the telecine when, when the uh, first, uh, you know, flying spot rank telecines came along. So you could scan off the original negative um, and get all the dynamic range off the negative and things like that. So, so that was a big leap in cinematography in the 80s. And then, uh, in the 90s with HBO and, and the 2000s, uh, the rise of, of cable and streaming, which had a whole different yeah. attitude for schedules and budgets. And they were less conservative about style and, and more allowed more of a feature style filmmaking to be applied uh, to television uh, in the 2000s, I think, is when that really started. So, um, so now I think television a lot of the interesting things are happening in television, yes. cinematography. Mm. Oh, okay, Mr. Mr. David. 
Oh, I, I know we have a lot of questions, but we have we don't have a lot of time, so let's be limited to the. We have, <laughs> yes. So, uh, talking about film or celluloid in the in the nowadays era, so there are directors and DPs who are still shooting photochemical films, like uh, Chris Nolan and his long collaborator Wally Pfister. Now he's working, I guess, with uh, with Hoyti von Hoytema, and there is Quentin Tarantino with Bob Richardson and others. So those people, those directors, DPs, they're still shooting with 35 millimeter film, maybe 70 film with IMAX, uh, 65 millimeter. Lately, they shot with the with Ultra Panavision. So my question is like, does film still have somehow a a certain superiority in terms of color reproduction, textures, highlights roll off, uh, the so-called organic look? Uh, or, or, or the digital is already like, like at the same level. Do we do they have like I don't know a, uh, an artistic choice? Do we do we have to keep film as an artistic choice? Is it important to preserve it as a choice also? I think uh, I'm always for choice, and I. I, I always get sad when things disappear, you know, like when Kodachrome film disappeared uh, oh. through Technicolor, you know, a long time ago. But uh, when all the other manufacturers stopped making film, like uh, Fuji and Agfa, um, you know, the, uh, they all look different a little bit. And they, even in a telecine or an electronic color correction, you can still see differences. I don't like to think of it now as a superiority issue because, um, digital is quite good and where it's superior or inferior are all in, in different ways of measurements, you know, like, um, yeah. you know, you, I wouldn't even say film has better color, let's say, you know, if you talk to a visual effects person has to do a lot of green screen work, they're going to say that most yeah. digital cameras probably have better color separation for them to be able to pull mats and things. Um, there's a certain amount of, you know, crosstalk between the color channels on film. Uh, there, it, all cameras have crosstalk between the colors, but um, sometimes uh, film just does it differently. And um, also, you know, people talk about higher resolution of film, but now digital cameras have kind of passed film on the resolution scale, except for a large format film. Oh, right. uh, and people just say, well, film is 4K in all color layers. You know, it's and when you use a camera with a bare filter, it's not full resolution in the red and blue compared to the green. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is all the layers of color film are not equal in resolution either. If you if you scanned and then measured the red, green, and blue separations off a color negative, you'd probably find that the red layer isn't as sharp as the blue green layer and things like that. So um, you know it's uh, it's so I, it's not really become a technical issue so much anymore, unless you want to talk about archivability, which I think film is superior to digital um, in terms of archiving uh, over long haul. But that requires storing the film in vaults at perfect temperatures in black and white mm. separations. But as far as tests have gone, film, if stored properly, has like a 400 year lifespan, which is something more than any digital oh. format can oh. claim to because digital still has to be stored on some physical medium. And so you're back to mm -hmm. what medium is it going to be stored on that's going to be free from gamma ray, you know, dis, dis, you know destroying pixels or, or bits of information over time and things like that. So right now, the only long-term solution for digital is migration, you know, data migration on a regular basis. So every mm -hmm. five or 10 years, you've got to copy your data over. Um, the other hand, you know, you can store many copies of a digital and, you know, film in many locations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, um, I think, uh, you know, you get lots of arguments one way or the other, you know, I think Steve Yedlin has done a lot of tests to show that uh, he can match the look of film very well with shooting on an Alexa camera or something. And, and uh, for him, it's uh, not really an issue. You can, you can, he can replicate the looks. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, um, Alex has the better, I guess, the the, the better look. It's a, it's it's a very near to, it's very close to, to to a film. It's a it has a kind of an organic uh, image to it. Look to it, yeah. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I, but you know, if you don't have the budget for a lot of manipulation uh, or post work and other things, you know, if you want the film look uh, and you can afford to shoot film, then then why not shoot film? And uh, <laughs> you're going to get that look without any trouble at all because it's it's inherent to it. So um, it has a certain beauty. It's hard to describe on faces. It's, it somehow is more attractive on skin tones. And I don't know if the, what the technical reason, lack yeah. of edge sharpness or, or something, but um, uh, it seems to see depth in the skin tones without without getting too much detail. And um, But uh, those are all subtleties, but I, I think there are certain things film does naturally uh, well, you know. Um, but there's also just the whole attitude towards shooting it, you know, with digital, a lot of things, what, what the big change for me was that directors who came out of digital would just shoot more footage. They would shoot more takes, they would shoot more angles because there wasn't any cost restrictions, uh, just time restrictions. But, um, but shooting more material every day doesn't necessarily make a better movie. In some cases it can, but uh, in other cases, it just leads to kind of a lack of decision-making, you know, just sort of shoot a lot and figure it out later attitude. So I think there's a discipline that comes from shooting film that's just inherent to the cost of shooting film. Um, I don't know if that's an advantage or disadvantage, though, you know, just the yeah. nature of film being expensive. What else? Uh, people have the money for film. Yes. They shoot it like it's yeah, digital. No, I like, where I worked on Westworld and we would just shoot miles and miles of film every day on that show. So so oh. it wasn't like oh. <laughs> it was a limitation because we were shooting film on that. We just, we shot as much film as we wanted to. Who, who chose like film? Is that Nolan? Jonathan, who chose the... Uh, Jonathan Nolan. Yeah. Oh, the Nolan family. It was him. It was him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Keen on the uh, shooting film. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Mellon, I, I have another question, which is like repeat. Uh, it's repeated from the audience. They are always asking and about the one shot or one take film. There's like he, like the rope, like uh, Gonzalez Birdman, like the Mendes, Sorry, 1917, uh, yeah. shot by Bad Deacons lead lately and got the Oscars. Chivo also got the Oscar for, for the Birdman. So what do you think about the technique? Like how it fits the purpose? What are the challenges facing the cinematographer or the director shooting in one take film? Can I add a small question to that? Uh, are we going to see any uh, David Mullen uh, one-shot movie anytime soon? <laughs> well, I, I keep joking that someday we're going to do a one-shot episode of Marvelous okay. Mrs. Maisel, the way we're going. Yeah, do an hour. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, personally, you know, some people think the, the single take thing is kind of a gimmick these days, but the truth is, I think the multi-camera shoot lots of angle thing is 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 the lazier way to to make a movie and and to to make it all work in one shot takes more skill, more work if you do it well. I mean, I suppose you could do a bad version of it, um, but uh, you know, it's all about staging so that you don't need the coverage. You know, if you stage a scene well with the actors and put the camera where it needs to be at the right moment, then you minimize the need for cutting. Uh, I've always liked films where the edits are there for symbolic or tempo reasons and not there just because the shot doesn't work anymore. So now we got to cut to a different angle of it. Um, the, sh the cut happens for, for an artistic reason rather than a technical reason. I, I always prefer that. So um, I, I like uh, films that, that tend to um, not to overcut essentially, uh, unless mm -hmm. it's for a musical reason uh, of some sort, a rhythmic reason. Um, so, you know, well-staged single take scenes are, are pretty exciting for me. And, um, but it really takes a good director to, to do that kind of stuff. And this, the cinematographer has to figure out how to make that work too, from a technical and a lighting aspect and, and physically moving the camera around. But, um, but it really is about staging and acting because the actors have to do it in one take as well. One take, yeah. Oh, maybe my, my latest question before we finish this, and it's not mine, it's, it's from the audience also. So the, the relationship between the cinematographer and a director. So you are a team, so not just you and the, uh, the director, there is like the production design, there is the costume, which is all the, the 
people contributing to the look and the spirit, to the artistic, artistical spirit of the, of the film. So between you and the director, is that like a relationship? Is there like a, a lot of a freedom? Is that dependent on directors? Who decides the, the composition, the lighting, the shots, the, 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 the angles? Yeah, it's, it's always a collaboration and it's different with every director. Some directors have a stronger hand in that and some leave more to the cinematographer. And it even depends scene to scene. It's not, some directors, you know, it's like with cinematographers, their focus or their passion or interest is on particular sequences that they, and then there's, there's sequences in between that, that there's, they've spent less time thinking about. Um, and uh, I think uh, it just depends on the director, you know, every ideally every director will collaborate with the cinematographer um but uh some have more opinions about color or light or, than others um I, I always like working with the director who cares about these things because if they care about the cinematography even if they're if they're very opinionated about it at least they're they're fight for things that are important to you you know if yeah. you need a certain location because of where the windows are or where you can get lights to it they will fight for you you know it's uh, directors who don't know know photography well and don't understand these issues are the ones that you have to deal with picking locations that are hard to photograph or uh. aren't, aren't visually interesting you know uh so you need a director with a good visual imagination good taste visual taste because they're going to make decisions on wardrobe and locations and things when you're not always there to be asked so and then in editing too, you know. So it's uh, it's important, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Mohammed, do you have any question? Uh, just a, a very small question, um, Mr. Day. Would like you to give us a small list of uh, good movies in terms of cinematography for someone who wants to enjoy yeah. and study cinematography. Like five, maybe uh, five movies. That you, that you think they're, uh, they reach the peak of cinematography? Well, I, it's uh, five is a very short list. I once wrote a list of recommended <laughs> films and it was please, about, please about give 100, us as much as you... I had like about 20 <laughs> per decade. It's so it's, okay. I'm not very good at whittling down to just five. You know, I would, uh, this just, you know, 100 years of cinema to, to recommend. Sure, I mean, sure. I would, definitely say Citizen Kane has to be on anyone's list. Yeah. Um, Godfather or Godfather 2, if particularly, if you have to watch one of the three. Um, Gordon Willis. Yeah, Gordon Gordon Willis. Yes, uh, Gordon Willis. You should watch a Storaro shot okay. film, whether it's Apocalypse Now might be a good choice yeah. or, or Reds. Yeah. Um, Do you know that Storaro came to Algeria and there's uh, maybe people in the, in the audience here that work with Storaro as um, mentees? Yes, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'd watch a Storaro shot film or The Conformist, one of his earliest, uh, you know, one of those films I would watch. Um, I'd watch a Technicolor film, you know, artistic one would be something like Black Narcissus, Jack Cardiff or Red Shoes, one of those two films. Um, uh, something by Conrad Hall, you could watch um, uh, his last film, uh, Road to Perdition, is a great yeah, movie. It's, it's great, yes. Oh, and there is, uh, there is even a video with, the, with Sam Mendes where they are discussing some of the, uh, of the shots on um, YouTube. Mm. Yeah, so I, would, yeah. I would watch that. Um, I'd watch Empire of the Sun just because, you know, it's be beautifully shot and Alan Davio just passed away last month. So it's, uh, yeah. it's just a really uh, well-made movie. Um, you know, David Watkin is another favorite of mine. I mean, I would say oh, something like Out of Africa, I guess, but I, I like his films like The Three and Four Musketeers, um, even Help, his early, one of his earliest film, Beale's film, Help, uh, um, or Catch-22 or, or something. Um, you know, Jeffrey Unsworth, I'd watch Cabaret. It's just, I could just list movies all day long, so I, it's hard. Yeah, to please. <laughs> Blade Runner, you know, that's a seminal movie. Uh, should everyone should watch Blade Runner again? Um, Definitely, I did. Amazing. Roger Deakins, you know, I'd watch uh, Assassination of Jesse James or No Country for Old Men. Oh yes, yeah, you know, all all amazing. 
Okay, so uh, David, do you have a, a last question or it's time for you to, I don't know if you have some time for us, five minutes maybe, another five minutes? Well, I have maybe time for one question. I might, I've got my computer plugged into my camera um, oh, rather than okay. the wall, so my computer is about to die. Uh, the red. I've got the red light on, saying that I'm out of power. <laughs> oh, so so one uh, more. I might have another question quick, quick, before my quick. computer goes dead. Oh, one more oh, question. Good question. Good question. Yeah, I don't think it's a quick question. It's a quick. It's a question okay. about, <laughs> about the motivation motivations behind the camera movement and the camera and the types of shot. So uh, I know it's there is not there's no like a, a book of rules that tells us that uh, we need to do a close up right there or a, a white shot for this or for example we start dollying on something on some on a subject for this. So do we have like a I don't know not the rules but do we have any uh, something like a cinematic language that dictates us what we do with the camera movement or the the, the type of shots we do? It's, no, I, I don't. There, you, it all has to come out of what the need of the story, the story is, this, uh, dramatically, and what you've decided the style, the limitations of style are for the whole project. You know, you may have a sort of look for the whole movie that may involve a kind of a austere quality or, or a very dynamic quality. It, it just depends on what you've decided is best for the story, and then when you get into the scene, within the kind of rule book you've created for the film, then you could say, well, we push into a tight close-up on a wide angle lens, that's our style. If we don't, or we only do it once or twice in the whole movie, that's our style. But you have to decide these things. And a lot of that's taste as well. But but ultimately it's all got to be in support of what is the scene about. Otherwise it's distracting, you know? And you, yeah. you have to, you don't want to do things that throw the audience out of the scene. Um, so it becomes a taste thing. And that's why even a push in, you know, you often do a couple takes because the speed is so critical. If you, mm -hmm. you, you, you go in first time, you go, no, that it just lands too fast and you stop too abruptly and you're telling the dolly grip, you know, you have to feather the start. It has to be about 30% slower. It needs to end on this line of dialogue, you know, oh. and if you stop short because they very, get very that delicate. line earlier, then stop on that line. Don't keep going to your mark. So there's all <laughs> these things because it's all about what feels right for the scene emotionally, right? Yeah. So you sure, need a very sure. sensitive focus puller and a sensitive dolly grip to, to feel those sort of things when it's a subtle move, you know, as opposed to just chasing someone down a street or kind of move. Um, so you have these discussions with the director, you know, what feels right mm -hmm. for the moment. Um, sometimes you, you, you say, oh, this is the right way. And then you shoot it and you go, that, that's not working. You know, we, we gotta- Let's do it again. Else, you know, doesn't feel right. Once you see it on screen, you go like, uh, uh, it throws me out or something. So it's all it's all about your taste and your your experience, basically. Sure. Okay, so uh, this is it, David or Sir. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you thank for you. your time. It was a really, really great pleasure for us to- Very informative, Michelle. Thank yes, you. Yes, to have you here with us. So I wish you a beautiful day and Stay safe, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, thank... Mr. David. Thank you so much. Happy. Glad to, ha to, to have you with us. It was yeah. very informative. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for our audience. Thank you. Bye.